We are coming to the end of our time in First Corinthians. Somebody said, uh, <laughs> there's a lot that we've gone through, a lot of heavy, heavy hitting, a lot of, you know, the, the deep work of, of study and expounding God's word. There are some tricky texts that we've navigated, but we thank God that we haven't, we haven't separated. <laughs> there's been no schism. There's been no breakup. Hallelujah. But what we, what we have understood is that God is sovereign over his word. Amen. Amen. And we can apply his word to our lives and our hearts today. Thank you, Sister Elena, for reading the scripture. Bless God. And I'm going to uh, kind of divide our message today into four parts. Okay. As I said, we're coming to the end of this epistle in 1 Corinthians. And this is actually the, the last in-depth and intentional teaching that Paul is going to deliver um, in this letter. So in chapter 16, it's mainly what I would call administrative stuff that Paul is dealing with. He's going to be greeting people. He's going to be sending blessings. He's going to be sending some information about what his future plans are. That's not to say that there's nothing to be gathered from chapter 16, but here we are in chapter 15, the kind of last teaching at chapter from this, from this epistle. And it seems fitting at this point to give a brief overview of the different things that we've looked at for the last 12 months. I looked on YouTube today, and I don't know if the date was absolutely correct, but it's the 30th of October is what it had as the first sermon. So the 30th of October, 2023, we began on this journey. And here we are on the first uh, Sunday of November. In a couple of weeks, in a few weeks, we'll be, we'll be wrapped up. Bless God. But we've spoken about many things throughout the epistle. Paul spoke about many things. He spoke about sectarianism and separating ourselves according to our favourite preachers or influencers or you know putting ourselves into different sects and groups because of who we uh, align ourselves to when ultimately we need to align ourselves to Jesus amen we spoke about considering ourselves according to God's standards instead of the world's standards we've spoken about worldly wisdom versus godly wisdom we've spoken about sexual immorality and how to deal with sin in the church We've spoken about exhibiting godly conduct and character. We've spoken about how we should relate to one another as brethren. We've spoken about marriage and singleness. We've spoken about food and uh, food eating and idols. We've spoken about living to the glory of God. We've spoken about church conduct. We've spoken about masculinity and femininity and headship. We've spoken about conduct at the Lord's table. We've spoken about spiritual gifts. We've spoken about love, the undergirding rule of love. We've spoken about the use of tongues and prophecy. We've spoken about our conduct in corporate worship. And I'm sure that isn't uh, an extensive list of all the things that we've covered over the last 12 months. But we've done a lot of work, a lot of ground covered. And um, I think a lot of the teaching that we've heard, a lot of us... I know for me, I'm going to have to go back and revisit and listen again and hear again and study again. And I guess this is one of the things that because we've covered a lot of ground and there's been a lot of topics covered, I don't know about you, but well, I think it's something common to humans that sometimes, I'm going to use a colloquial saying of this generation, we get lost in the source. We can hear all this thing and it's like, okay, well, we, let's focus on the hats or let's focus on what food we're eating, or let's focus on this, that, and we kind of almost the very thing that Paul warns us against in the first place of like almost taking doctrines and aligning ourselves to one particular thing and making that our identity, that we can do that, we can hone in on one thing because the whole is a lot to take in. But here at the beginning of chapter 15, I'm thankful that Paul brings us back to the gospel. Hallelujah. He brings us back to the gospel because we have a tendency to get lost. We have a tendency to get caught up. We have a tendency to major on the minors and to minor on the majors. 
But this is what Paul comes back to. He says, if we're going to be the people that God has called us to be, if we're going to be the church that God has called us to be, if we're going to be the witness that Christ has called us to be in the world, as much as Paul has done his apostolic duty and he's corrected and he's exhorted and he's instructed and he's given sound doctrine, he knows that ultimately what will independently develop godly character in the life of the believer that will independently develop good conduct and thinking is their continual exposure to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The gospel is the account of God's undeserved mercy and favor to mankind. Despite our sin, despite our rebellion, despite our disobedience towards God, which is actually deserving of death. It's deserving of eternal punishment and eternal separation from God. Are you with me? But God has made a way for us to be rescued from our sin and punishment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And instead of spending a life separated from God in eternal damnation and punishment and torture, that we can spend eternity in relationship with God, experiencing the blessings and fellowship of God, both now and forever. The only way this is possible is that God himself came down to this earth in the person of Jesus Christ and subjected himself to the death of the cross and was buried and rose again three days later having conquered sin, hell and the grave. He later ascends to heaven and Christ himself sits on the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and I. But he did not leave us comfortless but he sent the Holy Spirit Hallelujah, to dwell within our hearts and to lead us into all truth, all wisdom and all understanding, everything pertaining to life and godliness. Hallelujah, but not only that, but he, he, he is coming again to collect us unto himself. Hallelujah, and to rid this world of sin and evil and wickedness and to make all things new so that we will live in the presence of God, the immediate presence of God eternally. Hallelujah, with no separation between us and the glory and the wonder and the splendor and the majesty and the goodness and the bounty and the beauty and the excellence of our God. Hallelujah, and forever we will live with him in eternity. Hallelujah, that is the gospel. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And so Paul says, he says that, You've got to hold fast to this gospel. Let me, let me get to the text. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. He says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Paul is even in just those few lines, Paul is dropping some deep theology because he says the gospel is not just a one-time thing. The gospel is not just a one-time event in the life of the believer. The gospel is not just you coming and answering uh, to the call of the preacher and coming to the front and getting prayed for and, and getting saved. But the gospel is, is continually at work in the life of the believer. Hallelujah. So what that means is it means as soon as I accept Jesus as my Lord and my personal saviour, I am saved. Hallelujah. I am justified. That means God has translated me to a place, hallelujah, in his own mind, hallelujah, that, is, that leaves me in a place just as if I have never sinned, hallelujah, I, I cast my unrighteousness and my sin onto the cross of Christ, hallelujah, and in exchange I receive the righteousness and the holiness of Jesus, and God sees me through that perfect blood of Jesus, and I am saved, hallelujah, I am redeemed, I am justified, and I am his. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But we're not just saved, but Paul says that we are 
being saved hallelujah because there's a continual thing that happens in our salvation and this is why we have to be continually exposed to the gospel because when we're continually exposed to the gospel what it stops us from doing is becoming puffed up because uh, the, the songwriter says I'm only human and humans forget but remind me remind me dear Lord draw back the curtains of memories now and then show me where you brought me from and where I could have been because now I am saved now I am seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus now God has removed me from my sin and let the Holy Ghost come in I can get to a place where I almost forget who I was so I begin to walk with an air of, of self-righteousness, not knowing that the righteousness that I have is not of my own, but it's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And, and I have to remind myself not to get puffed up in this thing that has been given to me, because this is not by works, lest any man should boast, but it's the gift of God unto me. I've got to continually keep myself before the cross, because I realize that hanging up there is my sin. Hanging up there is my shame hanging up there is my guilt upon Christ Jesus who knew no sin who deserved no punishment yet became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him I've got to keep the gospel ever before me I've got to keep the cross ever before me I have to keep the gospel ever in my heart and I have to keep exposing myself to the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and, and what I declare to you is the gospel. That is the narrative of scripture. But God wraps up the gospel in 66 books. <laughs> Glory to God. That as I get into the word, I'm constantly reminded of who I am in him. Who I was before him. And who I am now because of him. And hallelujah. Not only that, hallelujah. But I'm reminded of who I shall be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I've been, I've been saved 20 years, but sometimes I even look, I'm thankful for what God did. I'm thankful for what God has done. I'm thankful that I'm not the same person that I was at 14 years old, but every now and then, Bishop, I see some things within me that make me kind of cringe a little bit. They, they make me kind of cringe a little bit because there's still some there's still some of that old man trying to rise up there's still some of that old man that just won't die that just doesn't want to let me go but I'm thankful that it won't always be like this I'm thankful that this won't always be the situation and the circumstance but one day God is going to draw me to himself in such a transformational way that when I see him I shall be like him Hallelujah. 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 Oh, bless the Lord. I uh, just got happy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I, I, I'm talking uh, to the saints who are on that same journey as me. And maybe you haven't been saved uh, as long as I have or as long as Bishop. But this is what Paul says in Philippians uh, 1 verse 3 to 6. He says, I thank God in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you making prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now and I am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ so I'm thankful this morning that not only am I saved, but I'm also being saved. Not only am I transformed, but I'm also being transformed. Not only am I whole, but I'm being made whole. Not only am I a son and daughter of Jesus Christ, but I'm being conformed into the image of Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the power of the gospel. And Paul says, all the things that I've taught you, all the things that I've declared to you over these past 14 chapters, if you really want to get a grasp and a hold of this, then, then I know there's lots of things for you to hold, but if you can just hold on to this gospel of Jesus Christ, if you can just hold on to this gospel and continue to reiterate the gospel in your mind and in your heart and in our times of worship, that we continue to remember the gospel and hold fast to the gospel, then your life will come into a alignment with the word of God with the declaration of God 
And ultimately, <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, he will complete the work that he has started. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. And then Paul says in verse 3, For I delivered to you as first of importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised in the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. <laughs> Some scholars say is that passage of scripture is an early creed of the church. So, as I said, that the, the getting, getting the grasp around the gospel may have been difficult for some people to fathom. It's like, because the magnet, the gospel, I like what uh, Pastor Mark says, that it's profoundly simple, yet simply profound. There's a simplicity to the gospel, so much so that a child uh, can accept Jesus and enter into the kingdom. But there's a profoundness in the gospel that we could live the rest of our lives and still be exploring and understanding and grasping the full extent of, 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 of what God has done. And even with all of that on this side of eternity, we won't fully know it. Paul says we, we know in part, we, we see as through a, a mirror dimly. We don't get the whole picture. So it's profoundly simple, yet simply profound. Hallelujah. So what they would do, and we see this in church history, that they would recite certain truths, universal truths that they knew about God and they knew about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what Paul quotes here is, is, is believed to be an early creed. Now, we have the Nicene Creed and we have the Apostles' Creed and there are all different creeds, even to the point of we have uh, in the Church of God our, our declaration of faith, what we believe. But this was just a simple way of helping people understand what it is that they believed. Hallelujah. I'll read it again from verse 3, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried. Hallelujah that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he has appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. Hallelujah. Though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then he appeared to the apostles. I just want to touch that last bit. It says, Jesus, after he died, after he was crucified, after he was put in the tomb, dead, 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 dead. Hallelujah. But he rose again and he was seen by people. And some people might say, well, maybe these apostles were so zealous that they became hysterical about the loss of their Lord and they began to hallucinate that they were seeing the risen Christ, but they didn't really see him. It was just a figment of their imagination. Or maybe some that were a little bit more spiritual, they, they, they said, well, maybe they just saw a ghost. And, and we can debate the reality of whether, whether we believe in ghosts or don't believe in ghosts, but it still, it still kind of puts some, well, is it true or isn't? But then Jesus showed up to 500 people at one time, showed himself alive, living, hallelujah, resurrected, and not just, not, not just a figment of your imagination, not just a spiritual resurrection. Some Christians, they say, because when, uh, this is in my notes, but when Mary saw Jesus in the garden and Jesus said, touch me not, they say, well, Jesus said, touch me not because he was a ghost and she couldn't touch his physical form. But we can put an end to that because when Thomas, right, it's Thomas that was doubting, and Jesus appeared to the disciples and Thomas wasn't there. But then Jesus comes back because Thomas says, I won't believe until I see him, until I, I touch the wounds, until I see the wounds. And Jesus shows up and he says, look, here's my hands. Touch, here's my side. 
touched Jesus, raised physically, bodily, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. This wasn't a ghost. This wasn't an apparition. This wasn't just a spiritual phenomenon. But Jesus was physically alive, walking and living amongst the people of that time to the point where Paul was writing and he said, some of the people are still alive. I'm not lying. You can literally go and talk to someone and, and ask them what their experience was of meeting the risen Christ. They sat on the seashore with him and ate ackee and salt fish and bami for breakfast. I don't know if the bami was there or the ackee, but anyway. Okay. So Jesus was raised bodily. It's important. And then he says, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of all the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle. Because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether it was I or they, so we preach. And so you have believed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, that's a good moment to give God praise. It's a good moment to give God praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, bless God. The reason why it's a good moment to give God praise is because sometimes we can feel like Paul. Imagine Paul, I was one persecuting the church, persecuting the brethren. I was, I was going against Jesus. I was working against God in opposition to God. And I wasn't even born at the right time. I, I wasn't one of those walking with Jesus. I, I, my name's not Peter. It's not John. It's not even Bartholomew. It's not even one of the ones that they hardly mention. I wasn't there when he was walking around Galilee and when, when he lived and when he was healing people. But as one untimely born, for some reason, God decided to reveal him himself to me. I wasn't there walking with him in Galilee. I didn't lay my head on his chest like John. I wasn't there. I didn't speak for him like Peter. I wasn't, I wasn't even at the day of Pentecost. But as one untimely born, God revealed himself to me and gave me a mandate, this mandate of apostleship. And we can identify with that as well, can't we? Because we weren't with the disciples either. But Jesus decided one day to reveal himself to us to reveal his love to reveal his grace to reveal his mercy and to reveal his purpose and his plan for us hallelujah hallelujah glory to God glory to God hallelujah bless the name of the Lord if you're a Christian this morning if you're walking with Jesus I don't know I don't know how your walk is going I don't know how your walk is going might be going great. You might feel like you're on top of the mountain. Or you might be in the valley. But I'm thankful that my salvation is not at the work of Byron and Pat Gray. It's not at the work of Philip Gray. It's not the work of Cassandra Gray. But it is a work of God. It is a work of the Spirit. And the Bible says in John 6, 44, it says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And then it says, and I will raise him up on the last day. We're going to come to that second phrase. But if you're here and if you have given your life to Jesus, and if you felt the drawing of your Holy Spirit, it may have been days ago, it may have been months ago, it may have been years ago, but that drawing wasn't some figment of your imagination. That drawing was done by the Holy Spirit. No one can come to Jesus unless the Spirit draws them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So even if you're down in the dumps this morning, I want you to know that you have been drawn by God. You have been called by God. You have been appointed by God. You have been chosen by God. You have been elected by God. You have been selected by God. And God says, I've called you by name and you are mine and none can pluck you out of my hand. You belong to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. 
Hallelujah. And Paul recognizes that my past is not something to condemn me or to hold me in bondage. But my past is all the more evidence of the grace of God. <laughs> ah, God. When, when the enemy comes and tries to tell you of things that you used to do and places you used to go and people you used to see and all of the evil that you used to be embroiled in and tries to condemn you with guilt and shame and say, well, how can you be a child of God? How can God call you? But you can turn around to him and say, that's the grace of God. That's the grace of God. That's the unmerited favor. That's the undeserved favor that I have from God. And he wouldn't give me that grace if he didn't love me. He wouldn't expound that grace to me if he did not love me. Hallelujah. He says, whether then it was I or they, the apostles, so we preach and so you believed. Glory to God. He says, I am what I am. I am what I am. By the grace of God, I am what I am. How long are you going to allow your past? How long are you going to allow your struggles? How long are you going to allow whatever it is that the enemy wants to use or even your, yourself, even your flesh wants to use to condemn you? How long are you going to allow that to keep you in this place of betwixt and between? Paul's sin and previous work could condemn him to say, I can't, I can't do this. Jesus, I can't live for you. I can't. Me, an apostle, me, call a sent one by you. That, it doesn't make sense. But Paul makes this decision. And we're going to see it more and more in this day and age. The Bible talks about the great apostasy. And some people are going to turn away and just say, well, I never believed in it anyway. But there are some people that are going to turn away and say, I couldn't get it right. I couldn't get it right. I couldn't get rid of my sin. This Christian walk was too hard. It was too difficult. So I thought it's better me just continuing my sin than try and live this life of righteousness. Uh, the devil is a liar. Hallelujah. But Paul is here. He, he says, I can step into condemnation and sin and guilt and shame and become weighed down by the sin that so easily besets me. Or I can step into grace. <laughs> I can step into the grace of God. Hallelujah. The grace extended to me. Hallelujah. And it's not a one-time thing, but it's an everyday thing. Every breath, every work, every act, every letter, every epistle, every instruction, everything by the grace of God. I am what I am by the grace of God. Hallelujah. 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 Bless the name of the Lord. I don't know about you, but that just makes me excited. It makes me happy. It reminds me that I am loved by God, called by God, chosen by God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No matter what that old tricky devil, that dragon wants to say, hallelujah. His word does not trump the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. So I said that one of the things that Paul spoke about in the earlier chapters was, was sectarianism. And from almost from the day that Jesus ascended into heaven, the church, or maybe following the day of Pentecost, <laughs> the church has had issues with men having begun this thing in the spirit, trying to complete it in the flesh. And what happens when we do that is we begin to lean more heavily on ideologies. We begin to lean more heavily into self-righteousness rather than the righteousness of Christ. We begin to rely on our intellect and our logic and our education rather than the spirit of God and the grace of God. And this is what was happening even in the Corinthian church that Paul, in those first few verses that I just spoke to you about, he reestablished, he reminded them of the gospel by which they were called, by which they stand. And he says, if you want to continue to stand, then you've got to hold on to this thing. But some of them, they were holding on to other things. Different ideologies, different doctrines, different teachings that were antithetical to the gospel. They were against the gospel. 
And so he says this, he says in verse 12, Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is in vain. We're even found to be misrepresenting God. Because we testified about God that he raised Christ. Whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you are still in all of your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ may have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only. We are of all people most to be pitied. You see, the thing about this gospel, the thing about the, the message of Jesus Christ and the words of Jesus Christ, we can, we can put our minds in a place of where this, this Bible just becomes a storybook. It just becomes some good, some, some good suggestions on how to live your best life now. It just kind of, it almost lives in a space in between reality and fairy tale. Or what we might do is, okay, yeah, I believe that Jesus lived. I believe that he died. And I believe that he did all the miracles and all the things that he did. But I don't really think much about him raising from the dead. And him walking around and being around people and showing himself to people. Like, we can leave that, right? Because... All that matters is that I'm, he died for my sins and I'm saved and I'm forgiven and I can live this life guilt free. Hmm? But Paul says, no, there's a, there's, a, there's a big flaw in that argument because if he isn't risen, then we're still in our sins and trespasses. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the ultimate completion of the promise of God. It's the ultimate completion of redemption. Of, of, of the forgiveness of our sins. Hallelujah. If Jesus Christ, not only does he have to die, because the thing is, they were, they were, they've been killing stuff for years. <laughs> killing goats, killing bulls, killing all of these sacrifices. And year after year, they have to atone for their sins because they're not ultimate. But the Bible says that Jesus became the ultimate sacrifice and died once and for all. And yes, he died the sacrificial death on the cross. But if he's still in the grave, what difference is it? What difference does it make? The Bible says that the wages of sin are death. So if Christ died and stays dead, then he's still paying the wages. Or the, the debt is not paid. So if Christ's debt is not paid, then our debt is not paid. But because on that Sunday morning, Jesus Christ arose, hallelujah, from the grave, with all power in his hands, hallelujah, symbolizing that he has power over death, hell, and the grave. He made a mockery out of Satan. He made a mockery out of death. He made a mockery out of sin. And I'm, I'm going into next week's sermon. But if he doesn't raise, then all of it is futile. But Jesus is our risen saviour and our Lord. Death could not hold him down. Uh, death could not keep its prey. Jesus, my saviour, he tore the bars away. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Vainly they watched his bed. Jesus, my saviour, vainly they sealed the dead. Jesus, my Lord. Why? Because up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. And every enemy of yours is an enemy of his. And death and the grave and sickness and guilt and shame. All of those enemies are triumphed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
Hallelujah. But this is Paul saying it, right? This is Paul saying it. And some people say, you know, you, you modern day Christians, you exalt the words of Paul above Jesus. So let's have a look at what Jesus said. In Mark chapter 12, from verse 18 to 27, bless God. So this, is, this, this passage of scripture is not long before Jesus is to be crucified. In my study, there's, there's something that I came across that when the, when the sacrificial lamb was to be sacrificed, what they would do is for five days, they would kind of spend five days just letting the lamb roam around, kind of segregated from the rest of the flock. And what they were doing, they, they were examining the lamb. They were looking at the lamb. Is there any defect? Obviously, they're going to examine it physically. But also, is there any kind of internal defect that we can't quite see? So that for five days, they'd just let the lamb roam. And the, it's, it's almost like they were checking whether the lamb was worthy to be sacrificed. And here in Mark 12 and in the preceding chapter, we see that the... Sadducees and the Pharisees they're they're examining Jesus they're interrogating Jesus they're asking him all kinds of questions they're questioning his authority they're questioning him about where where should we pay uh, should we pay money to Caesar or not they're trying to find something to catch him out hallelujah but Jesus tempted at all points not just in the wilderness by Satan but tempted at all points tested at all points interrogated at all points yet without sin So even Pontius Pilate had to say, I find no fault in him. Hallelujah, 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 the spotless lamb of God. But here in chapter 12 from verse 18, the Sadducees are coming to him and they say this. They say that there's no resurrection. And they ask him a question saying, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child, the man must take a widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife and when he died, he left no offspring. (laughs) And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. And the seven brothers left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. The Sadducees kind of being, you know, trying to be tricky. They said in the resurrection, when they say rise again, whose wife shall she be? Jesus. (laughs) Jesus. <laughs> for the seven had her as a wife. So they're basically saying this resurrection business is foolishness. Because if this is in the law of Moses, then what would happen in a scenario like this? It's it just kind of, they're saying it's foolishness. But Jesus said to them, is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are quite wrong. See, there's there's something that we need to understand about the Sadducees. I've I've spoken about this before. We had the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And oftentimes in the New Testament, when we see them, we kind of conflate them as one group, right? We we kind of think, oh, there's just almost one group of people. They're kind of, you know, they're big on the law. They're a bit legalistic. They're effectively one group. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they they were diametrically opposed from one another. They didn't like each other. They didn't like each other. One would say to one, you're too, you're, you're, you're too righteous and pedantic. And the, one, the others would say, well, you're too liberal and too rational. So they were different. The Sadducees were very pragmatic keepers of the faith. They dealed in logic and rationality. They had a faith that aligned with the, with the spirit of the age. <laughs> In that time, Rome, everybody is about wisdom and knowledge and understanding it's a kind of it's it's a it's a carry on from the greeks ruling the world through alexander and so forth so it's very much about logic and rationale they only regarded the first five books of the scriptures they only regarded the pentateuch or the torah of holy scripture 
They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in demons. And they didn't really believe in the afterlife. In contrast, the Pharisees believed in the books of Moses, the first five books, but they believed in all of the law and the prophets and the wisdom literature. That's the books of Solomon and you know Proverbs and all of that kind of stuff. They pretty much everything that we consider canon now, they, they took that on. This is the whole law. This is the whole word of God. And they believed heavily in the sovereignty of God. So they believed that, that God oversaw everything that happens and has his hand in all things that happen. But the Sadducees were like, well, no, God's kind of, he created the world and he's pretty much left us to it. And it's like, it's, it's about our free will and what we do and how we uh, respond to God. And as I said, the Sadducees spoke nothing of the afterlife. So in this passage of scripture, in Mark, <laughs> the first thing that Jesus says after they've given their little kind of um, scenario is that, you're wrong because you don't know the scriptures. And verse 25, he says, for when they rise from the dead. So immediately Jesus dons their argument. He's saying there is a resurrection. It's not a if, it's not a but, it's not a maybe, but it's a certainty when they rise from the dead. And he says, you're asking some question like you think you're clever, but it's, it's elementary. It's childish. He says, they neither marry or are given in marriage. But I like the angels in heaven. And some of you might get scared because you love your husband and your wife so much. You want to spend eternity with them as husband and wife. And maybe Jesus here is saying that marriage doesn't exist in heaven. Or, in fact, let me not go into that. Let me not go into that. <laughs> so some of it, yeah, don't, don't, don't swear it. But he says, and as for the dead being raised, verse 26, he says, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him and says, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are quite wrong. So Jesus here, he says there is a resurrection. But then he doesn't even have to say it, but it's like the books that you count as scripture, you think they don't speak of the resurrection. You think that they don't speak of the afterlife. But when God meets Moses at the burning bush, this is an undisputable their understanding of scripture. He goes right to Exodus, the second book. And he says right there in the second book, when God meets with Moses, God does not say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then Jesus says, for he is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It excites me because what God is saying is that you think that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are dead. And therefore you think everybody that has died in righteousness are dead, but there's a place in God in which they are alive, very much alive. And God says, it's not that I was their God is that I am their God hallelujah so I'm grateful to God that there is a place in him that the ones that we have lost the loved ones that we have lost they are not dead but they are alive in him hallelujah let me let me let me break it down because Jesus was the resurrector and we see in the scriptures that he raised Jairus' daughter. He raised the, the widow's son who was in a casket, literally in the funeral procession. And Jesus raises him from the dead. And then one of the most, uh, the famous story of resurrection is that Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We see those in Matthew 9, Luke 7 and John 11. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. But in John 11, when Jesus is talking to Martha, he says, Martha, your brother will rise again. And Martha, she kind of aligning herself with the Pharisees here. <laughs> but she says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. She says, I believe in the resurrection. I believe that it's going to happen. And Jesus doesn't, he doesn't do away with that. But he says to her, I am 
the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And everyone who believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who is coming into the world. Even in that statement, she didn't understand what Jesus was about to do. But Jesus says, my very existence is resurrection. My very person is resurrection. You can't divorce me from the resurrection. You can't divorce me from some of the more supernatural things in scripture. We have some people that say Jesus is just a good man. He's just a wise person. He's just, he's just a a guru of, of some sorts and they want to deny all of the miraculous things of him they want to deny that he was a son of God they want to deny that he was God himself God the son the second person of the Trinity but Jesus says you can't divorce me from who I am I am the resurrection and the life and anybody who believes in me though they die yes you're gonna see a physical death but when the disciples asked him well what's going on with Lazarus Jesus says he sleeps because there's an understanding in God that those that die in Christ are not dead, but they're just sleeping. Ah, uh, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. So those that we love and that have died in Christ, there's a place in God and they are alive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we can debate whether they're whether they're there, whether they're walking in the courts of heaven, I believe that they're sleeping. They're just resting in the bosom of Jesus. But they're very much alive. And I don't want to go into the, the, next, the next sermon. But there's going to be a great alarm clock. There's going to be a great alarm call. Hallelujah. When Jesus comes, hallelujah, and cracks the sky, hallelujah, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, dead to this earth, but just sleeping in eternity, and God is going to sound the call, the trumpet is going to sound, and it's going to be like an alarm clock, and they're going to get up from the best sleep that they ever had, just to meet with Jesus in the air, hallelujah, hallelujah, ah, goes back to what Paul was saying, if it was in this life only that we had hope, we'd be of all men most pitiful. He said this gospel is so glorious that it doesn't just change you now. It doesn't just transform you now. It doesn't just allow you to enter into the benefits of the kingdom now, but it's a gospel that transcends the grave. It transcends what the end of all things. Something that we all are going to come to unless we're caught up in the rapture. Everybody has to die, but Jesus says that is not the end. Hallelujah. In fact, when we look at the Hebrew alphabet, the Alpha and Omega, they are pictures of doors. It's a pictographic alphabet and they are pictures of doors. So when we, ha when we end, come to the end of this life, it's not the end, it's just that we're walking through a door. We're just walking through a door because there is no end to him. Hallelujah. And he is the resurrection. So we can have faith that transcends beyond this life. It transcends beyond the now and transcends even beyond the grave. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For we shall be raised with him. Hallelujah. He is the resurrection. Let's stand. So if you're here this morning, the offer into this truth that Paul has proclaimed, that Christ has proclaimed, this truth of the gospel, that your sin, it warrants damnation and torture and eternal separation from God. But God has made a way through Jesus Christ that we can live with him now and forever. Hallelujah. And if you want to, if, if you're saying, I've not given my life to Jesus, I've not accepted this gospel, I've not accepted this good news of Jesus Christ, this offer, I've not accepted it. Hallelujah. I want you to, I want you to come and meet me here at the front. Somebody said it's not just... <laughs> Hallelujah, it's not just pie in the sky. 
but it's cake on your plate while you wait. <laughs> the goodness of God now and forever is open and accessible to us all. Jesus, we thank you for your glorious gospel. Lord, we thank you, God, for who you are. We thank you, God, that in your mercy and in your grace, that you made a way for us to draw near to you. Lord, after our sin separated us from you and you should have had nothing to do with us, Lord God, you made a way for us to come close through the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can enter into relationship with you. We can have you walk with us every day of our lives and transform us into the people that you've created us to be. And that when we die, it's not the end. <laughs> Lord, but we shall spend eternity with you. Lord, we will be risen with you. We will meet you in the air. Oh, what a sunrise. Oh, what a meeting. Oh, what a gathering it will be. Lord, and we will see you face to face. And we will spend eternity in your presence forever. Lord, we thank you. And ask the worship team to come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name.